point out anything in me that offends you, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Let's bow our heads for moments of silent confession. Lord, we confess our need for you. Lord, we love you and we are so grateful that you are in control and that we can put our trust in you alone. When everything is shaking around us, you are a firm foundation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let us hear the good news. I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. We confess our faith. We confess together what unites all of God's people. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. From Ephesians chapter 4. Let's stand together. Again, as we lift our voice in song.
spring day and the children are going with Tina downstairs can be excused right now. So wonderful to gather and we are gathering and we are safely gathering and I would encourage you if you are thinking about coming back, if you're watching us, you're thinking about coming back, that uh, give it some real serious consideration because we are still safely gathering and um, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for those who are uh, increasing numbers of people who are getting vaccinated, thankful for the availability of the vaccine, and we continue to pray for the end of this uh, pandemic. We've been praying for a number of people within our congregation, within our church family, and we appreciate your continued prayers for uh, uh, Katie and her ongoing uh, uh, chemotherapy, for Cindy Johnson, and for her journey right now, and we're thankful for the, the peace of God that she is experiencing and for the love and care of her, her family. But I'm reminded again of that scripture that I've, I've mentioned before from uh, the Apostle Paul in, in, in 1 Corinthians where he says if, if, if one member of the body suffers, we all, we all suffer. And there is one member of, of our body, a person that you may, may not know that, that well, but she is a member of our, our church body here, and that's uh, Pepe uh, Olson, Dan and Pepe, very faithful attenders. Um, Pepe, if you if you've never met her, she is from uh, uh, from Myanmar, Burma, and uh, that country is in a very very bad place right now. Just a few weeks ago, they, there was a military uh, takeover. Um, democratic government was was overthrown. There's been great violence, great repression. The government has shot and killed peaceful peaceful protesters who have come into the streets. They have shot and killed their own people. There is great fear. There's great restriction of movement within the country. And Pepe has family there. She has sisters and other family members who, who are in uh, Myanmar. Myanmar is a predominantly Buddhist country, but it has a, it has a history of Christianity that uh, goes back quite a while with missionaries coming, uh, and one of the first was Adoniram Judson, a Baptist who came from the United States, and for that reason there are a large number of Baptist Christians and other Protestant and, and as well as Catholic Christians in, in Burma. So the body of Christ is there, the church is there in Burma. And you should know that one of our church family's loved ones are there. And they're fearful. It's difficult. It's hard. They're trusting the Lord, but it's a very fearful, fearful time. So I want to ask you to pray for Myanmar, as people around the world are, that the evil that is being perpetrated would be brought to an end, that democracy would be restored, that the violence would be ceased, and pray that the church in Myanmar would be strengthened will be able to be a light in the darkness and share the love and hope of, of Jesus Christ in the midst of this and pray for uh, Pepe's family, for their protection, for strength and encouragement uh, to them. May we bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for the privilege and the opportunity of worship. We have heard your word speak to us the very words of Scripture. We have sung the truths of Scripture. We have been reminded of the good news of the Gospel. We have confessed our need of you. 
Now, Father, we come in intercession, and we thank you for the privilege to come before the throne of grace. And we thank you for the ways that you work through and use the prayers of your people. We pray for your continued hand of care and blessing and healing to Katie. And as she undergoes her second um, infusion tomorrow, we pray especially, Lord, for just a shield of protection around her body. And that, Lord, you would use this means to bring about the, the healing that we all desire and that Katie desires. We continue to pray for our sister Cindy, and we pray and thank you for your presence with her and for the peace and the grace that she is experiencing. We pray for continued healing to her. We would ask for the restoration of her life here. And we thank you, Father, that Cindy belongs to you. We pray for her family to be encouraged and to be lifted up in your care. We pray for the country of Myanmar, so far away from us, and yet the news that we get from there is, is brought to us instantaneously, and we can read about it in the newspapers, we can hear it on the news reports, and we, we come against, in Jesus' name, the, the evil that is being perpetrated, the, the brutality, the violence that is being directed against the citizens of that country. We would pray for an end to this, Father. We would pray against that evil in the name of Jesus. We would pray for the restoration of peace, democracy. The people, Lord, would be able to breathe the air of freedom once again. And we especially pray for uh, the church in Myanmar to be strengthened. And, Lord, that the, the church in this difficult time would be united and empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a beacon of hope and light in this darkness. We would ask for protection, Father, for Pepe's family, for a shield of your protection around them. We pray for their physical needs that they may be met. And we pray, Lord, that they would be encouraged and that fear would be lifted from them. And their eyes would be raised to you. Now, Lord, this time in our worship is, is a time in which we come to the hearing of your word. And this is such an important time because it is the means by which you work in our lives through the preaching of your word. And we thank you for this. We ask for your help in the proclamation of your word. Help the one who opens your word and help all of us as, as hearers. And Lord, that we would not just be hearers, but doers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You turn with me again in your Bible to the Gospel of John and to uh, the 13th chapter, and we're going to pick it up right where we left off. The 13th chapter of, of John, we're going to be reading verses 31 through, through 35. Judas has just left. He has left the upper room where he was with Jesus and the other uh, apostles. He has left, as John so poignantly put it in the preceding verse, in verse 30, that as soon as he had taken the bread, the bread that Jesus had offered him from the table, he went out and it was night. He went out into the darkness. Not so much the physical darkness, but the darkness that engulfed him of evil and betrayal and sin. When he was gone, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children... I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I have told the Jews, I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, 
if you love one another. This is the word of the Lord. How do you advertise Christianity? Now, if you, uh, if you go online and you just do a, a Google search for church marketing, <laughs> you, will, you will see that there are all kinds of things that will come up. There are companies and organizations and, and, and businesses that can help you to uh, help a church to, to market itself. There are all kinds of tools. But years ago, advertising was primarily, you know, ads in the newspaper. And, and now, a lot of people don't, don't read newspapers, and, and so consequently, you very rarely ever see an advertisement for a church in, in newsprint. But when I was a kid, when I was growing up, I can remember, and it's, it, 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 it fascinated me as a teenager after I became a Christian, I would pick up our, 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 our Saturday paper, and there was at least one full page, and sometimes two full pages of church ads. And they were interesting as you, you know, as you would look through them. And as I think back on them, I, I think about how they were absolutely filled with cliches. So there was the old, the old first church, you know, in the downtown part of the city where actually most of the congregation didn't live anymore, but they're trying to have a presence down there. So the old church in the downtown part of the city had in its ad the church at the heart of the city with a heart for the city. Now, on the other hand, there was a church, there was the church that was a few miles outside of town. But they wanted people to know, hey, we're, we're out here, and you might have to drive a little ways to get us. So their ad said, the difference is worth the distance. But my favorite cliche written ad that I, I can remember was the one from the church that said, you know, first Baptist, first Baptist Presbyterian Church, whatever it was. But the cliche in the ad was, your end, of the, your end of the search for a friendly church. How about that? How do you advertise Christianity? What we're looking at today is, is actually uh, not a way to advertise the church, but it is the, the way that Jesus said the world will know really who the church is. Jesus said there is one way above all other ways that the world will know who the church is and that God's people are God's people. We have here in John from the mouth of Jesus what he says is the greatest and most effective advertisement for Christianity. And amazingly, amazingly, this, this advertisement for Christianity works across centuries and across cultures. It worked in the first century in, in a Middle Eastern and Roman culture. It works in the 21st century in Europe and Africa and Myanmar and Ukraine and wherever Christians are found. Now just for a moment, where, where are we at and why is this important? Well, we are, in, we are in the upper room with Jesus. That's where he shared that last Passover meal with his disciples. And that's where John recorded that he, had, he washed his disciples' feet. He took the servant roll, and he washed the disciples' feet. And towards the end of this time, Jesus says something that has the effect of just kind of throwing a bomb into their midst. He throws this, he, he says something that throws a bomb into their midst that explodes and leaves them stunning. What in the world does this mean? Now Jesus begins a very short, at this point, he begins a very short but important and intensive time of teaching. The truths that we are beginning to see here in chapter 13 and, and that he, this teaching continues on through chapter 16, these are truths that were vital to those disciples, absolutely vital for their continuation as followers of Christ, and they are absolutely vital for us as disciples in the 21st century. Now I just want you to note verses 31 and 32, because uh, we're actually going to skip those for today. But you see, everything in verses 31 and 32 revolves around the word glorify, glorify. 
Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. Now there is something tremendously important there in what Jesus is saying. But we're going to skip it for now to put our focus on just one thing, but we're not going to forget about it. When we get over to chapter 17, and we look at the beginning of Jesus' great prayer, we're going to come back to this text and put it right alongside what Jesus prays for in chapter 17. Now we need to see three things. First, we see a new reality that confounds the disciples. A new reality that confounds the disciples. What is Jesus' tone? Look very carefully how John describes it. What is the tone in Jesus' voice? He starts this out by saying, my children. In the, in the NIV, it says, my children. In other translations, it says, little children or dear children. It's actually, one, it's actually one word that he uses. And this is the only place in all the New Testament, this is the only place where that word is used, except in John's first letter, where he uses that same word, translated here as little children or dear children, he uses it addressing his disciples in his letter. It, it is a word of tenderness. It is a word of care. So you need to note the, the, the tone that Jesus is taking. It is, it is a tone of great tenderness. It is a tone of care. My little children, my dear children. It is as, now it is, it, it is not as a master talking to a servant or even a teacher to a disciple so much as it is a, a father to a child. Now Jesus has to speak to them uh, a hard truth. So after addressing them as little children, he, he speaks a hard truth in verse 33. He says, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. What? What do you mean we cannot come? You are our life. We have left everything to follow you. We've been with you for, for over three years. You're telling us that you're going somewhere and, and we can't go there? Yes, he said, I, I, as I told the Jews, so I'm telling you now. Now that telling the Jews is a reference to what he said to the Jewish religious leaders back in chapter 7 and verses 33 and 34. At a whole other occasion, back in time, he said, where I am going, you, you will not be able to come. So they were aware that he had said it to them, but these were the religious leaders who hated him and, and, and wanted to kill him. But now he's saying it to, to them, where I am going, you cannot come. So he's saying two things. He's saying, I'm leaving, I'm going which was the bomb thrown into their midst. And not only am I leaving and I'm going, but where I'm going, you cannot come. Now, he, by that, he does not mean, listen, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven soon, and you're not going to be able to follow me there. No, no, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, I'm going to go to the cross less than 24 hours. I'm going to go to the cross, and you will not follow me there. And I am leaving. Leaving. He's leaving us. Here is a new reality and one they don't understand, and it raises all kinds of questions in their minds. And as we follow on and we go on from this text and we move on through chapter 16, we'll discover that it is, it is very much their unspoken questions, their unspoken concerns that drives what Jesus is saying to them through chapter 16. Without their ever expressing it to him, he is giving them exactly what they need to meet this need in their life in light of what he has just said. Now, here is one of their very felt but unspoken questions. How will the world know that we are your disciples? If you leave and we're left here, how is the world going to know that we are your disciples? I mean, right now, at this point, it's, it's, it's very easy. 
We follow you around. We go where you go. We do what you do. And so right now, the world can identify us as your disciples because we're hanging out with you all the time. We're with you. But you're just telling us that, that we're going to be gone, that you're going to be gone, and, and we're left here without you. And the world is not going to see you with us anymore. It, 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 it's it's going to be us. So if you're not here, how is the world going to know that we are your disciples? This is a very important question. The question is really important. For us today, what will identify us as the disciples of Jesus? What will identify us as the disciples of Jesus? Now, Jesus makes it clear that what will identify them and us as disciples will be, it will be by a new love, a new love that makes real our confession of faith. A new love that makes real our confession of faith. Verses 34 and 35. Let's carefully, let's carefully uh, break this down. First he says, this is a new command. A command. Jesus gives a command. He doesn't say, I'm, I, I'm, giving, you a, I'm, I'm giving you a very helpful suggestion about things right now. Uh, I, I, I'm giving you an option that if you choose to follow it, will be helpful. No, he says, I'm giving you a command. Now just, just think about that word, command. This implies two things. It impl first, it, 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 implies, it implies authority. It implies authority. Who has the right to give a command? Only one who has authority. So I'm, I'm driving down the road. I'm driving down the road, and I see this kind of beat-up car over at the side, and this, this guy walks out, and, you know, he's got jeans on and a, and a, a, a T-shirt, and he just kind of walks out the road in front of me and, and goes, you know, motion me to pull over. I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to pull over. <laughs> I'm going to speed up and go on. I'm not going to pull over. But if I'm driving down the road, and there's a guy who walks over from, from the side of the road to the middle of the road, and he's wearing a uniform, and he's got a badge on that uniform, and I see the side of that car, and it says State Trooper, and he goes to me, I'm going to pull over. What's the difference? He has authority. He has authority. Now, his authority, the, the authority of a policeman, the authority of a boss, the authority of an elected official, that's all a delegated authority. But Jesus can issue a command because he has the right to issue that command because he is Lord. He has the right to issue that command because he is Lord. And Jesus does not give his disciples suggestions. Jesus does not say, to, when Jesus says something to them or he says it to us, it's, it's not a suggestion, it's a command, and he has the right to command us. And that may be a crisis in your life. That may be a crisis for the person who's considering following Jesus, because understand, if you're following Jesus, he has the right to command you. He has, he says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. He is Lord, he is God, he is sovereign, he is king. He gives commands because he has authority. So, it implies authority and command. When Jesus says, I'm giving you a command, it implies obedience. It implies obedience. Why would you obey Jesus? Why would you obey Jesus? Because, because you call him Lord and because you love him. Just look over to the next chapter, to chapter 14, and verse 15. And this is the great, the great, the greater motivation for obeying Jesus. Chapter 14 and, and verse 15, he says, If you love me, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So a, a, a command implies authority. Jesus has the authority to issue this command to them. 
And they have a responsibility to, to obey it because he is Lord. But even going beyond that, they are, go they are going to obey this command haltingly, brokenly, imperfectly. They are going to obey this command because they love Jesus. And that is true in my life, and it's true in your life. Why do we want to obey Jesus? Because we love him. Because we love him. Now, Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. Now, notice he called it new. He said, a new command I give to you, love one another. New? But it's not really new at all. Way back under the law of Moses. Way back under the law of Moses. Leviticus 19, 18 was a command to God's people. Love, love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, Jesus took that command, love your neighbor as yourself, along with the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He elevated those two commands and said, this is all the law. All the law is wrapped up in these two commands. So there was a command given centuries and centuries before. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so how is this a new commandment? I want to suggest that it is a new commandment in two ways. It is new in its quality. It is new in its quality. Listen to Jesus' words. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And those are the words we have to sort of camp out on, soaking. As I have loved you. In the same manner in the same manner in which I have loved you, you must love one another. So how has Jesus loved these men? He has loved them with commitment. He called them to be his followers. And he, com he, he committed himself to them. Through the ups, through the downs, through times in which they were, they were utterly, utterly frustrating. He loved them with commitment. He has loved them with patience. Oh my goodness. You just, you know, you read through the four gospels and you see the interaction with Jesus and the disciples, and sometimes they are just as they are just as dense as a cement block. And they have ridiculous discussions among themselves, like which one of us is the greatest? But he's loved them with patience. He has loved them with kindness. He has loved them. He has loved them in the ways that Paul describes love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That's the kind of love Jesus had for them. It was a patient love. It was a love that didn't go, didn't go around reminding them of their past mistakes. It was a love that bore with them. It was a love that sought their good. This is a new quality of love. And above all, he says, you love one another. You love one another as I have loved. You. Above all, he has loved them with sacrificial service. Go back to the beginning of chapter 13. John's introduction to what Jesus is about to do in washing their feet. In chapter 13 and verse 1, John said, It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father via the cross. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He now showed them the full extent of his love. How did he do that? By setting aside his garment. By setting aside his right to be served and taking that towel and girding it across his waist and bending down and taking that basin and humbling himself to wash their feet. He loved them with sacrificial service. 
but they would learn that what he did that night in humbling himself to serve them by washing their feet was just a very, 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 very small demonstration of sacrificial service. The ultimate sacrificial service is when he would allow himself to be crucified, to become a sacrifice for their sin, to be beaten, tortured, humiliated, shamed, and to die. Above all, he's loved them with sacrificial service. So you see, Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment. It is to love one another as I have loved you. Jesus calls his disciples to a new to a new quality of love. This is a quality of love. What Jesus is calling them and us to is a quality of love that is totally upside down to how the world views love. Because the way the world basically views love is you do good for me, you love me, and I will love you back. And we understand that. The world understands that kind of love. You love me, I will love you back. You do good to me, I will do good to you. Jesus, Jesus' love totally reverses that. He says, I, I'm going to lay down my life for my enemies. I'm going to serve those who hate me by dying for them that they may be reconciled to God. So Jesus calls his disciples to a new quality of love and a, a love that they themselves will actually experience at a deeper level than they even know at that moment. He's calling them to a love that they will experience at a deeper level when the Holy Spirit fills them because Paul said in Romans 5, 5, the love of God is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit is given to us. So this is a love that's new in its quality. Secondly, this is a love that's new in its creativity. It's a love that's new in its creativity. Jesus is, is seeing the big picture. Jesus is seeing what the, what the, what the bigger picture is, what, what the goal is, that several weeks down the road, after his resurrection, he's going to gather this little group of men together, and he's going to give them an incredible set of instructions. He's going to give them another command. He's going to say, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Or as he said in, 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 in Mark, I want you to preach the gospel to, to, to all creation because the agenda is so much bigger than what you can imagine. The agenda is not just your individual salvation. The agenda is I'm creating a new people. I'm, I'm creating a, a, a new people. And the love, it is the love of Jesus, listen, it is the love of Jesus flowing through these very imperfect disciples in the first century. It is the love of Jesus flowing through these very imperfect disciples that creates community. So this, this love is not just new in its quality, it's new in its creativity because this, this is the love that creates Community, the community of the church. And this is the great miracle that unfolded in the first century and on into the centuries that followed. In a hostile, in, in a hostile world in which Christians were a very tiny minority and totally outside the, the mainstream and virtually hated and shunned by, every, by everybody and persecuted. Yet the church grew. And it grew, and it grew, and it multiplied. And it took in all kinds of people, Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, rich and poor. And even though it was despised, and even though it was put down by all the authorities, Jewish and Roman, the church attracted people. And what attracted them? <coughs> A community of love kind of community that was not found anywhere else. A community of love. There was a pagan philosopher in the third century who was actually a great critic of Christianity, was opposed to Christianity, but a pagan Roman philosopher made this observation, quote, about Christians. He said, it is amazing how they love one another. How they care for one another. 
He said, I don't see it anywhere else. So this love is new in its creativity. The church will be born, and it is, it is, and it always will be a community created by love. Now you see how important, if you go back and you look again at this text, verses 34 and 35, you see how important this command is in the repetition of it. When something is repeated in the Bible, you know it's very, very important. So notice how Jesus repeats this in verses 34 and 35. A new command I give you, one, love one another. As I have two, as I have loved you, you must love one another. Three, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Three times, three times in those verses. And then if you go over to chapter 15, you'll see he repeats it not very far off in the future. He repeats it in chapter 15 and verse 12. My command, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And then he repeats it again in verse 17. This is my command, love each other. So, so five times in a short amount of space, five times, Jesus will repeat this command. Love one another. Why does he do that? Why does he do that? Why? Why that repetition? Why that emphasis? Well, there's more than one reason. But here, Jesus focuses their attention on this, this one reason, verse 34. By this, by this, your love for one another, all men will know that you're my disciples. I'm not going to be with you. They're not going to physically see me with you anymore. But by this, your love for one another, all men will know you are my disciples. Here is your badge of discipleship. Here, here is your Jesus follower uniform. If you love one another, by this, all men will know you are my disciples. It's not the bumper sticker on your car. It's not the fish symbol on your on your coffee mug. It's not how you it's not how you vote. It's not how it's not how orthodox your doctrine is. And I think being orthodox in our doctrine is very, very important. I think right theology is absolutely crucial. But let me tell you something. I've known people, I've listened to people, I've known people personally who could cr cross, I mean, dotted every, dotted every theological I correctly, crossed every theological T correctly, but they were loveless. Loveless. Cold. Without kindness, without compassion. There's actually a term that was coined several years ago for that kind of Christianity. It's called dead orthodoxy. Dead orthodoxy. All the right truths, but without love. You know what Paul said there in 1 Corinthians 13? He said, if I don't have love, I'm, I'm just like a big, noisy gong. I'm like a big, noisy gong. This is your badge of discipleship. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. You see, in the first century, the pagan world saw the difference. In the 21st century, does the pagan world see the difference? Do our neighbors, the people in our extended family, the people that we work with, the people in our community, do they see the difference? So what have we seen? Jesus gives his disciples a very simple set of instructions. Essentially, he says three things. I'm leaving. While I'm gone, your love reveals me in my absence. Love each other. I'm leaving. Love each other. And your love reveals me in my absence. It's not complicated, but we find it difficult. Let's not kid ourselves. We find it difficult. And left to our own resources, we will be frustrated at Jesus' command. Left to our own resources, we will be frustrated. We will be frustrated. We say, well, I am trying so hard to love those people, that person, whatever. And I just, man, I cannot, I cannot crank it out. Well, no, that's exactly right. You can't crank it out. Left to our own resources, we will find it difficult 
to obey this command, but the good news is we are not left to our resources. We are not left to our own resources. There is a new power, there is a new power that enables us to love. The power to love one another does not come from self-effort. The power to love one another does, does, does not come from our, you, you know, trying harder, resolving more. I'm, I'm, I'm just going I'm just, I'm just to love those people even though they, they I'm going to love that guy even though he irritates me. I'm going to love that woman even though she gets under my, my skin. It doesn't come from self-effort. It comes from the transforming power of the gospel to change our hearts. The transforming power of the gospel to change our hearts. It comes from a source outside of us. The power of the gospel that has saved us and made us children of God and removed God's wrath from us and closed the gap between us, that same love, Paul says, is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So the power to love one another does not come from my or your self-effort. It comes from a transformed heart and the availability of the Holy Spirit. So let's do what we need to do. Let's admit that it's hard sometimes. And let's ask God to allow his love to flow through us into those hard places, to those difficult people, to those times in which we don't feel like serving. And we don't, we don't really feel like doing for them what Jesus did for his disciples. We have a resource. We have a resource. It's not self-effort. It's not crank it out. It's acknowledge my neediness and realize that I already have the power source within me. It's the Holy Spirit who is pouring God's love into my heart. And if I allow him, he will channel through me to other people. Our lost and needy world does not need a cliche. Our lost and needy world does not need to here are the kinds of things that I describe that, that you read on church ads. You know what the truth about advertisement is? And I, I'm not down on advertisement at, at all. And I think we need to adapt to the way advertisement works today. It's not primarily through newspapers or through print. It's, it's online. I, I'm, nothing, I'm not against it. Of having a presence online for, through Facebook or, or whatever. I'm not, not at all against, don't misunderstand it, I'm not at all against advertising and letting the letting the world know hey this is this is who we are this is who is standing but listen to this listen to this all the advertising in the world all the advertising in the world all the advertising that money can buy if it is successful accomplishes just one thing it gets someone to walk in the door to your worship or your bible study or your gathering once all the advertising in the world, all the money can buy, will be successful if it does one thing. It will get a person to walk into the door, into your fellowship, into your worship, into your Bible study once. It will not bring them back a second time. It will not give them a reason to return. The reason to return has to be found within something that people find in the lives of, of the church when they come something that's real, something that's not like plastic flowers, love that is real, that's expressed through kindness and compassion and tenderness and sacrificial service to one another. That brings people back. Let's bow together. Lord Jesus, your words were very direct. Not, not complicated. You said, you said, I'm leaving. And you need to love one another. And your loving one another is how the world is going to know that you're my disciple. That was true in the first century. It's absolutely true in the 21st century. So Lord, help us to examine our own minds, our own hearts, our own lives. Are we allowing your spirit to work in us? Are we allowing your spirit to, to nudge us, to convict us, to move us along 
Are, are we allowing you to direct us into that kind of love? Because on the one hand, we know it's not natural. We are, we are incredibly self-centered as human beings. But Lord, you are at work within us. You are changing us into the image of your Son. So Lord, help us to obey you in this command. Help us to obey you in the practical ways, the day-to-day -day ways, that we can demonstrate love through commitment, through patience, through caring, through kindness, through encouragement. Help us to, to do that, which you did for your disciples, and now you told them to do, do that for one another. And amazingly, amazingly, and surprisingly, that's the way that you draw other people. That's the way the world knows that we're genuine and that we belong to you. So help us, Lord, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand together as we close this Thank you for sharing this with us also. And now as we close, may, may we receive the Lord's benediction, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. May the grace 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.